So I think uh, we can get started. If you can please take your seat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Ezra's Roundtable Seminar Series for this academic year. Uh, my name is Andreas Malikopoulos. I'm a faculty uh, with the CE uh, and also a field faculty at the Systems Engineering. Today is a great pleasure to have Professor Sam Das from the University of Delaware. Uh, Professor Das uh, received her PhD at Penn State University and then she moved on to the uh, University of Pennsylvania and did a postdoc with uh, working with uh, Professor Vijay Kumar. Um, she has received numerous uh, awards, uh, including the a graduate fellowship uh, at um, uh, Penn State University, uh, a fellowship from the government of the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, science and engineering excellence in research from the University of London. Uh, she is now a faculty at the University of Delaware. He's spending this semester at Harvard Medical School uh, doing some uh, research. So with this, I would like to thank off to Professor Das and uh, join me in welcoming Professor Das today. Thank you, Andres. And um, I want to thank the department for inviting me here. And I want to thank all of you for coming here during your lunchtime. Uh, I have a lot of videos, so I hope that helps, you know, like stay awake. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the kind of research we do and what inspires us and, you know, like how we can use these micro scale robots for a variety of biomedical applications, including um, cellular patterning. So um, you guys all watch the movie, but I'd like to start with this movie. So this was a movie in 1966 called Fantastic Voyage. And, you know, as someone pointed out very correctly, basically you have a bunch of scientists, they get miniaturized, they go into another scientist's brain through blood vessel and they go and they fix um, some issue that he has in his brain. And the reason I, I show this is to uh, emphasize that things at the micro scale, so, you know, small scale has always fascinated mankind since a long time ago. And I think truly the start of, you know, chips, computers, small scale uh, research started with this amazing seminal lecture by Richard Feynman called uh, Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And I, in fact, I would definitely suggest taking a look at that uh, seminar. It's available uh, on the internet free of charge. And basically here he talks that there's nothing stopping us from going smaller and smaller. There's no physical law. So when we talk about small, like how small are we talking about? So if you think about your hair, not the length, but the width, the width of your hair is about 200 microns, right? So the robots that we make, if they are about 10 to 100 microns. We never go above 100 microns. So they are about one tenth about of the width of your hair. So they're definitely very small. You can't see them with your eyes, right? So, um, so you know, when you think about robots, you know, everybody has, you know, there's a lot of people who work with macro scale robots. We've all seen like Boston Dynamics robots. They're jumping, they're moving, there's legged robots. So every time I talk about, oh, micro scale robots, everybody thinks that you're just going to take those Boston Dynamics robots, you're going to take a medical robot and just going to make it smaller. That's not how that works, unfortunately, right? These things, they're so small that you can't put a battery, you can't put a computer, you can't put a camera on that. So then what should they look like? So there you have to look to biology, right? So all biological entities, like, for example, um, I don't this. So this is a very famous video of, uh, so you see this, this is basically your white blood cell. So this is the white blood cell and this little kind of tiny thing that it's chasing, that's a bacteria. So this is your white blood cell is chasing a bacteria and it's gonna you know, kill the bacteria. So if you think about it, um, things at the micro scale should look like what biology does. Because everything that biology is made of, cells, bacteria, virus, fungi, they're all microscopic organisms, right? So what do they look like? They generally look circular, right? Or maybe a rectangular at max. They don't, they don't have legs, arms. Maybe they have a flagella or something, you know, waving about. So we take our inspiration from biology. So we want to make microbots that kind of look like what intelligent systems look like in biology. So when we talk about intelligent system in biology, uh, what does that mean? That means that you have some kind of um, 
like a code or some kind of um, signal, right? Generally, those sig that signal is in the form of a chemical, you know, maybe there's food, maybe there's poison, maybe there's, you know, so the bacteria can go towards food, can go away from poison, right? So it, it's some kind of signal. You know, the biological entity uh, takes that signal, it processes it, right, whether it's good, bad, and then it does some action. So either you're going towards food, you're running away from food, I'm sorry, running away from poison. So we want to design microbes that can do the same thing. So they can take information, they can process it, and so, you know, they can have some measure of intelligence in them, like that is in your body. So it's never going to look like a human being intelligent or maybe even a car AI intelligent. But it's still intelligent because, you know, bacteria is intelligent at some level. So this is a pretty tall order. You know, how do we do this? How do we make them totally man-made, totally artificial? This is some, it's not really uh, totally intelligent, but these are some examples. So basically what you have is you have some, uh, a bunch of microrobots. They are uh, silver-based microrobots. And they are doing this kind of fireworks, and this is a heartbeat kind of motion. Um, in response to some information, some stimuli, in this case, it's light. So this is the kind of systems that we want to design, right? And so they do not look like Boston Dynamics robots. They don't have legs. They don't have arms. They are generally only circular or maybe some other shapes. Um, okay, so what do microrobots uh, look like? So microrobots, there are a couple of ty uh, types of microrobots. So one is a physical microrobot. So this is where you have a robot that is driven by some kind of physical field. So it could be like an external field. It could be a magnetic field. It could be light, electromagnetic waves. It could be sound, ultrasound. Um, you know, there's maybe pH gradients and things like that. So this is an example of um, these are helical robots. So they kind of look like this. And um, they can move in uh, biological media, and they are driven by a magnetic field, right? So if you have this kind of helical motion, because they have um, a magnet, a magnetic material on them, and when you put them in a magnetic field, that material responds, and you can drive them. Um, another type is biohybrid. So here, um, the robot is driven by a biological entity. So it could be a, a, a motile cell, um, it could be sperm, it could be flagella. So, you know, anything that moves, uh, but it is living or biological. So you can have robots that are driven by that. And then the third type is um, what I would consider the one that is the closest to a uh, like a biological intelligent robot, which is a chemical microrobot. So um, what happens here is the robot has some chemical on its surface, generally it's a metal, in this case it's platinum. Um, and when you put this robot in, um, in, some, like in a fuel or some chemical, uh, which depends on the metal that you have, for example, in this case, the chemical is hydrogen peroxide. So when you put this robot in hydrogen peroxide, what happens is um, platinum decomposes hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So if you've ever bought um, hydrogen peroxide for your house, they say to keep it away from sunlight. Why do they say that? Because over time, if you have photons, it's a source of energy, it will decompose your hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen and will lose its uh, efficacy. So it's the, kind of the same principle, but instead of photon providing the energy, you're actually, the platinum is the catalyst here, there. So when that happens, so you can imagine that, you know, if only the hydrogen peroxide around the platinum is getting decomposed, so now you have hydrogen peroxide over here, but not over there. So you have a gradient, either of products, of ions, or something, right? So that gradient uh, makes this robot behave almost as like a battery. So there's a self-generated electric field, and that drives the robot. So it's the same principle of how things move in your body, ADP. Right? How does HP move things? You're ge basically generating electric fields, you're generating ions, and those move cells in your body, right? So it's kind of the same principle. So these are the ones that are most, uh, they're the closest to biological systems. And um, in, this is kind of what they look like. So this is, these are really tiny, they are two micron robots, and they're just moving around. So if anybody has ever done, looked at bacteria in solution, they look exactly like bacteria, and they behave the same as well. A lot of the principles for bacteria can be applied to these microrobots as well. 
And then you can also combine them, right? So you can combine uh, a chemical and physical actuation. So this is where kind of my group uh, mostly focuses their effort. So what we do is uh, we take a circular robot. So it has platinum on one side, um, and this is just an inert material. So when you put this in hydrogen peroxide, uh, you know, you again have some buildup or uh, around the polystyrene side and that drives the robot, right? So we can also put magnetic nanoparticles inside. So now this robot is magnetic, okay? So if you've, everybody I think here has driven a car at some point in their life, right? So what happens in a car? You have to put gas in it, right? And the gas drives the, uh, the car. So you can think of the platinum and the hydrogen peroxide the same way. It's the gas that drives the robot. But you need to also steer your car, right? How would you drive it where it needs to go? So the magnetic field is like your steering wheel. So it will steer the robot, even though your hydrogen peroxide is the one that's driving it, right? And so the way we generate these magnetic fields is um, using these coils. So if you generate, if you uh, run electric field, electric current through copper, and you, uh, what you end up uh, doing is generating magnetic fields, right? So this is just an electromagnetic coil. Um, it's very standard, you know, physics principles. So that's what we do, um, and we can use this to like drive micro robots. Um, we can use this to uh, drive multiple micro robots. So this is three micro robots in 10% hydrogen peroxide. There are five microns in diameter, and. What I want to point out is they're moving separately, but they're also kind of connected. So this is a robot dance. So they kind of come together, they go further away. And this is a very, very hard thing to do because this is a severely underactuated system, right? So you only have one magnetic field. So this is the magnetic field direction, right? And, but you're trying to move multiple micro robots, even though they, you know, they all kind of respond the same in the magnetic field. And that's why the chemical actuation becomes important. Okay. So these are some of the types of micro robots that we can work with. So let's talk about now systems, right? So this is a systems engineering, engineering talk. So um, if we are trying to get micro robots to do any kind of useful work, if we are trying to uh, control collective of these micro robots at the small scale, we can't apply principles of macro scale robotics, right? Because they're so small, 10 micron, five micron, there is no battery. There is no camera that is as small as that. So how are you going to control them? How are they going to sense anything, right? So there, what you have to do is you have to incorporate the actuation and the sensing mechanism together, right? So whatever the robot is being actuated with, whether it's magnetic field, electric field, light, uh, anything, you can use that to sense as well, right? So generally, we use uh, these robots to sense like chemicals or how things have, how the field has changed. So you have to incorporate the sensing and the actuation together. So we can do it in a, in a number of ways. So this is an example. So um, this uh, is, these are our robots, right? And we can control them using these electromagnetic coil systems. So this is a 2D, so there's uh, four coils. They're all in 2D, so you can control these robots in 2D. We can also put coils up like in the, in the Z plane, kind of coming out of the plane and going in and you can control them in 3D as well. And so, um, you know, you to use a microscope because they're so small, use a microscope to image them. The camera takes images, gives the computer information about position, the shape, where it is located. Then we have a controller that does some calculation. Uh, we have our written algorithms and it basically tells the power supply um, how much uh, electricity to put and where. And that will determine how much and where the magnetic field is generated. And we can use that to drive the robots. So this is kind of what the robots look like. Um, this is an SEM image. So SEM is just a very um, high, um, high resolution microscope. Um, so they look like this. They're basically circles, right? Um, and we have patches of different kinds of metal on them. So the iron is there to make them magnetic. And the platinum is there to remember so that we can drive it, the gas for our robots, right? Um, and this is the control control system that we use. So this is how we do experiments. We basically put our, um, we have a glass light, uh, we put the robots on it, put them in hydrogen peroxide, 15%, 10%. These uh, robots are buoyant, so they float up to the top, they go on the air-water um, interface. 
Um, this is very important. You know, why should we care about interfaces? If you think about it, in biology, you everywhere is interface. You have a cell-cell interface, you have cells in liquids, you know, vesicles. Interfaces are everywhere. So it's very important to be able to drive microrobots on interfaces, right? Not just in bulk or you know, near the surface. And then we have um, a microscope and you can uh, watch what these robots are doing. So here you can see these are two micro robots and we're basically moving the microscope as the robot is moving. And so you can see it almost looks like, you know, like a jet engine, right? A rocket. So they have all these, um, can anyone tell me like what this is? If you remember what platinum does, right? It makes hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. What is oxygen? Oxygen is a gas, right? So these are all the gas bubbles of oxygen that are coming out. It's the same principle as a rocket. So um, with the magnetic control, um, oh. okay, yeah. So with the magnetic control, um, they're just a, the earlier video, the robot was just moving on its own. With the magnetic control, we can actually control how it moves. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but this is the robot. You can see it looks like a Pac-Man with like little bubbles at the end. You can kind of, um, but this is a much better video. So here, the robot is being moved, and this is just a bunch of like particles, you know, just for visualizing. Um, and you can see that the robot can be moved in different ways again using this magnetic coil system. Um, so, you know, why do we want to do this, right? Remember what I was talking about, you have to think about actuation and use them for any application. So what we can do is um, we can use these robots to move things around at the micro scale. So just like, you know, it's hard to uh, control things at the micro scale, it's similarly, it's hard to manipulate things at the micro scale. So if things are wherever they are, they will kind of want to stay there. There's, if there's nothing like making them move. So we can use these micro robots to move things around. So these are just a, like a bunch of hollow uh, particles, uh, hollow vesicles, and which are important because vesicles are what your cells are made of, right? And we can use our micro robots to move and make uh, like a pattern out of them. I think they're going to make a square. Yeah. So this is all real time, right? Okay, um, uh, we can also um, make other patterns. So my student is going to make a UD, so the, uh, which I'm going to excite to fix. Again, they're all real time, right? So I'm going to fast forward so you don't have to sit through him. Uh, just. So this work was done by my graduate student, Max, and my postdoc, David. Um, and this is actually just David doing this. So I hope you guys caught the UD at the end. There's a U. The U, there's a D definitely made, and this is kind of the U that's being made, right? So we can do manipulation at, again, interfaces here. Okay, so some other kind of robot that we uh, make is uh, Mickey Mouse. I'm not allowed to say Mickey Mouse because it's copyrighted, so please don't come after me. But <laughs> this is what it looks like. So, you know, it's basically, it's got a little um, face and like two ears. Um, and we, the, this is a fully magnetic robot, so there's no chemical actuation here. We're just using magnetic field to move it. And we can uh, use it to do a variety of uh, manipulation, especially with cells. So this is kind of the robot is dragging these cells like the Pied Piper, you know, the drags rats. That's what this is about. Um, we can, so we've moved on, we've kind of uh, made more sophisticated controlling. Um, options for our robots and here uh, you can actually control these robots now with an xbox controller so you know this is still like a student or someone has to do it but you can just use an xbox controller to turn the magnetic fields and make the uh, robot move wherever you want it to move um so this is what the robot actually looks like and this is an SEM image and this is the robot moving um not as, I guess, sexy as it looks, but <laughs> things at the micro scale, they look a little bit different. Um, so yeah, so this is totally magnetic field. So we can use the magnetic field to move these robots. We can use, again, as I said, those robots can be used to manipulate cells. So this is, um, it's an embryonic kidney cell that the robot is moving. So you can see that it pushes this uh, cell. But it also can kind of drag the cell around it. So this is where the Pied Piper comes in, where it can drag the cell around. So you can see it's being dragged. 
Um, another kind of robot, again, magnetic, that we make is these uh, rolling micro robots. So these are circular robots, and they are coated with um, half nickel. So the nickel makes it magnetic in this case, not iron. And we, again, control them using, um, it's still electromagnetic system. It's called just a Helmholtz coil system. It's a name for the system, but it's still the same electromagnets running electric current through um, copper. Um, this work, yeah, so this covering, so this work was again done by my students, Max and David. Um, the work before was done by my postdoc, Zamir. And so here you can see that uh, as we turn on the magnetic field, the robots are all moving, um, you know, in the direction of the magnetic field. So this video should tell you how hard it is to control these robots in like a swarm of them, like multi-agent control at the micro scale. Because you can see that when you turn on the magnetic field, they all react the same way, right? So how do we differentiate that? How do we get motion differentiation at the, at, in the same workspace? So this is why we had to incorporate the chemical aspect, because that's how you can kind of differentiate their motion. If you have, but there's other ways to do it with just magnetic uh, field as well. But here you can tell that they're all kind of moving in the same direction, right? So if you want them all to go in the same direction, great. But if you want to have some kind of swarm, not very great, right? Um, but if you want a bunch of robots or if you want to control one robot, we can use them to do a variety of things. So these, this is these micro robots moving on surfaces. And again, these micro robots moving on interfaces. So remember I said interface is important. This is an air liquid interface, so water and just air. Okay, so I showed you a bunch of robots, right? So, um, but now we have to control them, right? So all of the advanced robots that I showed you, they were all controlled. It was all open loop control. There was a poor student or a poor postdoc controlling them, you know, uh, controlling the Xbox controller, moving them around. But if you want to do any kind of automation, if you want to do any kind of closed loop control, this is where you have to think about the whole system, right? This is where you have to think about, let's say, actuation first, obviously. You know, what kind of automation will depend on the actuation. Localization, where is your robot, right? Um, how are you going to detect it? They're so small. How are you going to detect them, especially if they're in the body? In the body, the microscope is not going to work, right? It's not transparent, right? Um, how are you going to track it? Once you have detected, now how are you tracking it over time? Um, then you have to design a controller. Then you have to design um, some kind of planning, motion planning algorithm. Again, when they're in the bodies, how, how are you going to do it? We don't know the, all the blood vessels. We don't know everything. And then biggest of all, biocompatibility, right? Whatever we design, whatever we do, it has to be biocompatible because a lot of our applications are, you know, biological applications. So we haven't solved this problem. Just I'm not going to be able to solve this problem at the end of this seminar. But, you know, I think we can give you some examples of what we do, right? So this is kind of how, uh, you know, my students, uh, Yanda and Max, they have designed a way to basically do closed loop control where, again, um, we are taking these images from the microscope. We are detecting what is a robot, what, what is a cell. We are detecting where the robot is, and then we are feeding, uh, you know, some uh, control schemes. We're feeding some... Um, control signals back to this Helmholtz coil system so it can actually move the robot where it needs to go. So there are some examples that I can show you. So the first one is, this is the, um, remember the bubble robot that I was talking about, right? The first, so this is a bubble robot being driven to a particular position. So this is all, again, real time. Um, and this is totally autonomous, right? We, we are not doing anything. Um, here, the bubble robot is following like a circle-ish path. It's not the best, right? You can see, but it's actually pretty good for this, for a microscale system, because the one thing that is a huge problem here is thermal noise, right? So thermal noise doesn't exist at the macro scale, but at the micro scale, it's a huge problem. The things are too small. Um, then this is an example of the, the Mickey Mouse. So this is the Mickey Mouse robot being driven to a particular position. And obviously, I showed you some examples of how we can use that for uh, uh, cell manipulation, right? OK, 
Okay. Then um, this is an example of a helical microrobot. So this is a robot that looks like a helix, and we can use it. Uh, so this is a totally um, a magnetic microrobot. So there is no. Yeah. Um, there is no chemical actuation, but you can we can use these magnetic system magnetic microrobot to trace whatever path. So we have written SMT, which is the name of my lab. And the robot can trace that path. This is UD. The robot can trace a UD. Uh, you can even use that to manipulate cells. So I think in the next video, um, yeah, the robot is actually going to pattern cells. So you know, this is where the top, uh, the top, the title of my talk comes into play. Uh, so it's a little hard to see. So this is the robot, the black one, and the. White ones are, uh, again, uh, embryonic kidney cells, so they are human cells. And the robot did uh, put them in a T shape, so now it's actually going to try to put them in a U shape. We're working very hard up here. Um, yeah, so we can use this, yeah, so you can see kind of like a U, yeah, U shape, right? So we can use these robots to do a variety of cell load patterning, so pattern cells. Um, here, the robots are moving cells from one um, chamber to another. So this is um, this is a microfluidic chamber, but it represents blood vessels, right? So if you want to move the ro uh, cells through blood vessels, um, you can use these uh, micro robots to put them inside a blood vessel or take them out of a blood vessel. OK, so. Um, I am almost at the end of my talk time, so I'm going to quickly kind of show you. So, uh, no, wait, I have more time, right? 150. 150. Okay, good, good. Okay, great. So, um, I want to show you some uh, applications of these micro robots. So, you know, so we talked about how we can move them, how we can control them. So, like, what do we use them for, right? Okay. So um, here, kind of, I want to first uh, give a brief introduction about patterning and why we should care about it, right? So when you think about it, everything in your body, all your organs, are literally just cells arranged in pattern, right? So they are particular kinds of cells, but they are arranged in a pattern. Because if you take your liver cells, and if you put them in, so liver has, um, I, I don't know if anybody has ever seen a liver or how the cells are arranged. But liver has like an hexagonal shape, right? So it has an hexagonal shape, uh, and that propagates throughout the whole liver. If you take your liver cells, and if you put them in any other shape except the hexagonal shape, your liver is not going to work, right? Also, if you take a liver and you take some cells out where you're destroying the pattern, your liver doesn't work. And that's how, you know, people's livers, they get necrotic, they lose some cells and things like that. So everywhere that you look, you have patterns, especially when um, em development is happening, embryonic development is happening. How does one cell become, you know, like a whole baby? It goes two, three, five, but how does it know where, how, what to change into? How does a cell know that I need to change into the brain or I need to change into the liver? I need to change into your stomach. It knows it because it, there's a predetermined pattern that it is in, and once it's in that pattern, its neighboring cells give it a signal, generally it's a chemical or a protein or growth factor, or whatever, and that's how it knows, okay, I have to change now into some other kind, right? So, so this, this is why pattern, patterning is very important, and if we can arrange cells into patterns, we can replicate, you know, organs, we can replicate biofilms, we can replicate, um, you know, how uh, organisms uh, infect human beings, we can replicate all of that. So these are some examples. So this is, you know, leaves, pattern in the leaves. You can see a pattern in fish eye. And this pattern has a very special name. Um, well, this pattern comes from like a very special kind of way, which is called a Turing pattern. Does anybody know what a Turing pattern is? So a Turing pattern is kind of the, um, you know, it was described by Alan Turing in 1952, and it's the basis of patterning, right? So how do things pattern at the, at, in, in biology? So things pattern because there is a chemical mechanism that's going on. So there are two chemicals, and they're diffusing, right? So they are moving into, on different rates. 
and the interaction between those rates and how they're diffusing and how they're reacting leads to the formation of patterns. And this is how it happens. So So there's a blue and um, yellow, right? And this is basically showing you how the blue and the yellows, their concentrations are changing. And that leads to the formation of this kind of pattern and it's generally called a Turing pattern. And you get it everywhere, right? So uh, uh, bacteria, they form, start forming Turing patterns and then they uh, expand to make biofilms and things like that, right? Okay, so, um, so if we want to replicate biological patterns, then we need to deliver these factors or chemicals, right? Just because remember biological patterns um, form because you have these chemicals that are interacting with each other. They are, being diff they are diffusing at different rates to cells, but in a controlled fashion. So this is the important part, right? So you have to control them um, because when in, in embryonic development or any kind of biological development, it always happens, it happens in a controlled uh, form. A lot of the genetic diseases that occur, the reason they occur is because when the embryo was developing, some chemical was not delivered at the right time or at the right place, right? So if you don't do it at the right time, at the right place, then you have the cell doesn't divide properly or the cell doesn't differentiate properly. And that's how you end up getting, you know, all the different like problems, right? Okay, so ch challenges. So why is it hard? So first is the, uh, spatial, the spatial control, right? So when we talk about a controlled manner, we're talking about a spatio-temporal uh, control, right? So first is the spatial. Okay, so generally, if you've ever done a biological experiment, what happens, right? You take some growth factor or something and you put it, you put it in your system and it goes to all the cells, right? But how is that replicating how biological patterns are forming? Because when biological patterns form, they're forming because you're giving the, the signal, the chemical to only one cell or maybe a bunch of cells, not to all the cells, because then all the cells would differentiate the same way, right? So generally when people do these experiments, you know, when tissue engineers do these experiments, they flood the entire system with whatever factor, whatever molecule that they need to give, right? So one is the lack of spatial control. How are you going to control that? The second is the lack of temporal control, right? So again, in synthetic biology or in genetic engineering, we generally don't have a control over when the cell starts activating whatever mechanism that it's using to differentiate or to move or whatever it is doing. So generally, we don't have control over this, right? Uh, this is a very stochastic process. You kind of just wait and the, the cell will tell you whether it takes 12 hours or 48 hours or whatever. And once it tells you that, then you submit, a, you publish a paper and then everybody just waits that much time, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. There is no way to control it. Um, and again, and once the signal is delivered, you can't reverse it. Same, people use these microbots or people do drug delivery with uh, nanoparticles, right? So once you've delivered the drug, you can't take it back. Right. It, when it's once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and then a lot of uh, a lot of the times it's also biological compatibility. Right. So you have to pick the right robot system. You have to pick the right delivery mechanism so that it is compatible with the cells. And also so you can actually image it. You can track it. You can see where it is. Right. OK, so uh, we have tried kind of solving some of these challenges. And so uh, what we can do is, this is a work that was done by my postdocs, Sudipta and Ramadan. And what we can do is actually use our microbots. So these are our microbots. They're happy when they're in uh, the blood vessels, but when they see cancer, then they're not happy. And they, then they're like me, and they can kill cancer cells, right? So basically, how does that work? So we take microbots, so these are circular microbots, and we attach um, a cancer drug, so it's a doxyrubicin, which is an anti-cancer drug, to this microbot, uh, and then we can the we can control how we attach it, right? So remember, uh, I was telling you that one of the problems is like delivering, and how do we control when we deliver it, right? 
So because we have control over how we attach it, we can change the attachment mechanism in a way that we have control over when we will deliver these um, anti-cancer drugs. So we can make them pH responsive, we can make them light responsive, we can make them uh, you know, magnetic field responsive and things like that. So uh, you, we attach this drug, doxyrubicin, um, onto this robot. Then we uh, use our magnetic system, our magnetic fields, and then we drive them to the cancer cell, and then um, the robots release the drug, and then they can kill the cancer cell. Right? Okay, so this is an example. So I wanna, it's a little hard. Okay, so here, you got two robots. One is here, one is there, and they are moving two cells in a bed of dense um HEK, these are like again mammalian cells right so all of these are mammalian cells this is important why because remember a lot of the experiments that people do and we do you have a robot and a cell and that's it right that's it everything else is empty but that isn't that's not how it is in your body right you're, you're surrounded with cells there's a lot of cells so how do we move you know, in a dense environment. So we were able to use our robots to move cells in very dense environments, right? So once we move them, then in this video, and then we deliver it to, a partic to particular cancer cells. And so you can see that this is a time-lapse video. So we take one frame every half an hour over 12 hours. And you can see that the cells are dead. Um, I guess I, I'm gonna play it again. So you can see that see the, the red ones are the robots, and then the, it's very clear the, the cell just bursts, right? You know, it's dead. So we can do this for a variety of different cancer cells. So we can do it for liver cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. So we uh, can you know use this method to kill uh, different kinds of cancer cells, and we can deliver different doses of our anti-chronic cancer drug as we want. Okay, so the next part is the one where, uh, you know, we can actually use it to do cellular patterning. Um, so to do that, what we need to do is actually control cell fate. So what does that mean? It means that we want to control what the cell becomes after we drive a robot to it. And why is that important? Because if we control what the cell becomes, then we can control what you know, how the pattern propagates, right? Whether you can control a stem, uh, if you can control and make a stem cell go to a liver cell, then we can make a liver. If we can control a stem cell to become a brain cell, we can make a brain, right? So it's very important to control what happens to the cell, cell fate, using our micro robots. So to do that, we interface our micro robots with <clears throat> engineered cells. And we can do it for both the bacterial and mammalian. So we can do this for both bacterial and mammalian cells. Um, bacterial cells, I'm not going to talk today, but you know, maybe if you have questions, please ask me. Um, so we can make Turing patterns with bacterial cells. But the mammalian cells is the ones that's most interesting to me because this is how you actually start making you know, organs or tissues or start make like a real difference, right? So how does this work? So we've done this work in collaboration with Ron Weiss from MIT. So um, I don't know if you have any synthetic biologists here, probably not, right? Uh, so how does this work? Okay, so in your cells, there is a circuit, right? Um, as in, um, you have a gene that tells something to switch on, then that makes something else switch on, and that makes your cell do something, right? So whether your cell is, um, like a white blood cell is chasing after a bacteria, or your cells are moving, or you know they are um, they are differentiating, um, whatever they they are doing, that happens because there is a circuit in your cell, right? All cells have natural circuits, but synthetic biologists can uh, put artificial circuits in your cell, so you can change what the cell will do native, what the cell normally does, and you can make it do what you want it to do, right? It's not as easy, but you can generally control it. 
So one of the things that controls development, one of the things that controls like what will happen to cells and what they will differentiate into or how they will move, is this uh, circuit called, it's called a notch, delta notch pathway. Um, and in there you actually have two cells, right? So there is a receiver cell, which has some receptors on its surface. And then you have a sender cell, which is another cell close to it, that has a protein on its surface and it's called the delta protein. And when that uh, cell comes close to the receiver cell, you know, the delta protein kind of attaches to the receptor on the receiver cell. And then, you know, the, this path, the pathway in your cell is activated and then something happens, right? Whatever the cell is supposed to do, it does that. So what we want to do is, uh, so this is what happens natively. This is what happens normally in cells. What we want to do is we want to say, you know what? We're going to tell the cell what to do, okay? And how do we do that? So we put a synthetic pathway in there, right? That still has a receptor on the surface, right? And then we put a synthetic delta protein. So it's not really a delta protein, it's some other chemical, right? In our case, in this pathway, it's actually GFP. It's a pro another protein that we can use. And then we use the microbe to deliver that protein. And this way, what we can do is we can control what the cell does first, right? We can control which cell does it, so spatial control, remember that, right? And we can control when, right? Because when we drive the robot to the cell, that's only when the cell, the machinery will be activated, right? So we can do spatial control, we can do temporal control, um, and then, you know, the synthetic biologists do, like, what it's it actually going to do. So I, I hope that you guys understand what's going on, right? Okay. So um, my student, Bingsy, um, can make these robots. So these are, again, circular robots, PLGA beads. It's a very biocompatible polymer. So these are very biocompatible. We dope them with magnetic nanoparticles. They make them magnetic. And then we attach these, uh, this protein that I was talking about. We use uh, biotin streptavidin uh, attachment, and then we can make these robots, right? OK. So. Um, so, again, so in this video, I'm going to keep playing this video and I'm going to explain what's happening. So what you have in here are cells, right? So these are mouse cells. They're called L9 to 9. In the mouse cell, there is um, a synthetic pathway that when we use our robots to deliver this protein, it makes the cell turn red, okay? So what we are showing you is that only the cells that have robots, actually that have more than two robots. So we can also do, do concentration dependence, right? So we can control which cell, uh, depending on how many robots we put into them. Only the robots that have more than two cells, so this one only has more than two robots, sorry. Only the cells that have more than two robots, so this one only has one, so that's not, um, can turn red. So you can see obviously this one, it has a lot, uh, this one is also turning red up here. This one has two, this one turns red. That has two in there, that turns red. So this one has two, so that turns red. So only the robot, uh, only the cells that have more than two robots are turning red. So this is telling us that A, we have spatial control because all of these cells have the circuit, but we've been able to just isolate which cells turn red and when, right? So it is after we deliver our robots to them. Okay, so we can expand it, right? So th that was a very simple circuit. It was just, you know, turning red, that's it. But you can make it complicated. So this is, um, this is these are uh, iPSCs, so stem cells. You know, these are human pluripotent stem cells. Um, and so this is a microbot that carries another cell. So, you know, this is a sender cell. So the microbot can either carry a cell that delivers this, uh, protein or it can deliver the protein itself. And then what we can do is just around the microrobot, these stem cells are going to convert into hepatocytes. So those are liver uh, project, uh, liver cells, you know, the starting of liver. So, so that's what we can do. So, um, so we can show you 
So these are Chinese hamster ovary cells. So it's just a kind of like mammalian cell, right? Um, so this is uh, this is a microba, and it is manipulating like a Chinese hamster ovary cell. So this is showing you that we can actually drive these. So remember, I was talking about how the robot is carrying a sender cell. So the robot can carry another cell and can drive it to like other cells as well. Um, the next video. So in that, what's happening is actually the robots are inside the cell. So not only can the robots push the cells, but they can also go inside. And they're totally biocompatible. The cell is happy, it divides, no problem. And we can move them around that way, right? So just because the robot is magnetic, and when you put a magnetic field and this, the robot is inside the cell, it just moves the cell with it. Okay. So uh, this is, it's a, it's a very pretty picture, but it's a little confusing. So basically what's happening here is that we have these cells, right? So this, these are sender cells, so these are the cells that would give you the signal. And the robots are inside the cell, they're a little hard to see because the cells are yellow, but, and our robots are white. So it's a bit hard to see, but they are in there. We know that we've done like SEM images, right? And, and then we have the receiver cells, which are uh, blue. But when the robots deliver the sender cells to the receiver cells, the receiver cells, the ones that have the circuit in them, that's why they're called the receiver cells. The sender cells are delivering something, that's why they're called senders. Um, the receiver tells, uh, cells would turn, they would uh, express red uh, fluorescence, so it's just MK, it's a protein, it's red in color, and they would change their shape. So that's exactly what happens here. You can see this, so this image has all the three kind of colors overlaid. So this is just showing you that all the receiver cells that are in contact with the sender cells with the robots in them turn red, right? So this is just showing you that we are able to activate the uh, genetic circuit in a mammalian cell in, um, using our robots, okay? So this is kind of, um, so, you know, some of the things that we can do um, using our micro robots. Um, so this is kind of the precursor to patterning, right? So once you're able to do that, then you can make different kinds of patterns. You can even see that some of the cells start clumping together, right? And you can start seeing um, the start of some very nascent patterning. And then we can uh, obviously do patterning with just the uh, micro robots themselves, right? So we are able to show that we can do patterning by, um, using the cells, but also just by using the micro robots, right? Okay, so um, that kind of brings me to the end of my talk. I think it's, I have, it was on time, right? Yep. Um, I just wanna thank um, all of my students, so everything that, uh, actually I think everybody's involved. All of, uh, all of my students uh, are involved in all the projects that you saw, and, but I definitely wanna thank my collaborators, Ron, um, he is the synthetic biologist who designs a lot of our circuits. Kalin, um, he's a controls person and helps us in controlling the microbats. Wendell is again a synthetic biologist and he provided us some uh, the rat cells. And Johan is another kind of systems biologist who helps us in, you know, like uh, a lot of bacterial work. And I also want to thank my sponsors, you know, we need the money, we can't do anything without it. But, and with that, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to check them if you want me to explain something more. Happy to do it. We do have some time for a couple of quick questions. I was wondering when you're talking about uh, you want the robots to do different things, but they're in the same magnetic field. Is it possible to just control the magnetic field at that level of spatial gradient? Right. Okay. So that's a, that's a really good point, and that's that's one of the ways people have tried to do motion differentiation. Right. So so um, the magnetic fields that we employ. I mean, it depends. The Helmholtz coil system tends to give you more uh, uniform magnetic fields, but you can do something like using magnetic tweezers, which have gradients. So if you've ever like drawn a magnetic field, right, gradient, you have areas where the magnetic field is very weak, and you have areas where the magnetic field is very strong. So one of the things that we are trying to do in our lab is exploit that, you know, to see, you know, exploit the fact that in some areas in, in the workspace, the magnetic field is going to be very weak. In other areas, it's going to be very strong. And if we can use that to kind of get that control multiple micro robots. Yeah. So it's, it's a totally 
it's an absolutely valid you know way to do it it's just it's really hard to implement it in practice yeah. any other questions for your speaker yes so so can your robots find a specific something but they don't know where it is to start with yes um because so one of the things that i didn't talk about, especially with the chemical microrobots, is they kind of um, can do chemotaxis, which is uh, taxis towards a chemical gradient. So this is exactly how like bacteria or your cells find, right? You know, you saw the white blood cells, how does it find a bacteria, right? Because the bacteria releases some chemicals and the white blood cells sense it, and the gradient of that chemical tells it where the source is. So the chemical microrobots can do it. They're not as efficient as white blood cells, but they can do it. They can follow gradients, like for example, of hydrogen peroxide towards a source. So um, in fact, there is an example of doing that. So there was a paper by Daniela Wilson where, so cancer cells, they release a higher amount of hydrogen peroxide than normal cells. And we can use, so basically in, in that paper, they use this difference in the amount and the fact that the gradient would be stronger for a cancer cell versus a normal cell to preferentially drive the robots towards the cancer cell. So even though the robots didn't know where the cancer cell was, but because the chemical gradient from the cancer cell of something was different, they could, they could find them. Yeah. Yes. So currently, we know the robots are not as effective as the WBCs, but can they learn from their mistakes as a reinforcement learning or a control theory part of it and become more effective over the period? Well, that's the dream, right? That's what we want to do, make them more intelligent. That's that use AI. Yes. So that's what we're working towards. Yeah. So definitely, maybe in like five years. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You say like there is uh, no written policy on like uh, things that it delivers uh, for the what do you mean written policy? It, once it's delivered, it, you can't undo it. So there's like, you can't. Yeah, so it's very hard to do it. Okay, never say never, right? I always say 100% doesn't exist, but only the Sith deals in absolutes, right? You should never do that. Uh, I would be crucified for it. So um, there are some mechanisms through which you can do it, like your, bio, your body does it, right? It's just really hard to do it in an like, you know, engineered manner, artificial manner, and not. So a lot of the ways people do it, they are using already, like, the antibodies or the antigens that are already in your body, right? So they're not creating anything from scratch, or it's not totally man-made. So you can't do it, the answer is, but it's really, really hard. And it's only for a small, yeah. Yeah, so to add on to that, um, is there, so there's, like, a lot of uncertainty on how it moves and what it delivers, right? Well, we have, no, I mean, that's what the closed loop control is about, right? So we're trying to reduce that uncertainty. Of it. So the whole point of closed loop control is that we know where the robot is and we can track it. And then we are like kind of making it move in the path that we want to make, make it move. But that's all like, that's why we do all this path planning, right? right? Because we want the robot to move in a particular path. Well, with this, let's thank our speaker again.